Josh currently serves as the Director of Public Works for the City of Birmingham. He is responsible for 630 personnel, along with a $45 million operational budget. His work involves the oversight of five major divisions across the city, waste services, construction operations, horticulture and urban forestry, facility services and administration. With over a decade of municipal experience, Joss has worked from an unpaid intern here in Tuscaloosa through the ranks of administration and leadership level positions. He has supervised maintenance crews and professional teams, managed millions in capital improvement projects, managed departmental budgets, and assisted in a citywide budget effort. His work has been with two of the top five largest metros in the state, and he has been heavily involved in everything from contracts, personnel, projects, permits, budgets, and targeted issues that each city faces. He has served as the Vice President and President of the Alabama Association of Floodplain Managers and graduated from the University of Alabama in 2010 with a construction engineering degree. Please join me in welcoming Joshua Yates. Well, I should have trimmed that down just a little bit. Sorry about that. Thank you, Zach. Thank you all for having me today. Um, I want to thank the um, Alabama Water Institute team uh, and the University of Alabama for having me here today. I'm extremely honored to be here uh, speaking with uh, leaders and teachers and students. Um, you know, as a, as a former graduate of the University of Alabama, I'm just excited to be back. I still live here in Tuscaloosa, and I'm honored to be here at the university presenting for you all today. Um, the director had me thinking a little bit, uh, so, I'm, so before I actually get into the presentation, I wanted to mention a couple of items. Um, he mentioned the uh, waste uh, and water situation down in the Black Belt, very familiar. Uh, I have a farm down in Lowndes County, which is right next door to Wilcox. Um, and also, we, we talked a little bit about drought, uh, or not drought, but flooding and drought and water issues. Um, I just so happened to be the person that was here at the time the state decided that every municipality or every water authority across the state needed a drought management plan. So I was uh, the lucky one that got to put that together uh, here in Tuscaloosa. Uh, it's good to know that here in Tuscaloosa we are abundantly blessed with water. In fact, uh, I believe, I'm, I'm going back off of memory, uh, but it, is, it would take seven and a half years of no rain in order to reach stage one of our drought plan. That's how blessed we are here in Tuscaloosa. Um, Lake Tuscaloosa was what it is probably the number one, besides the university, uh, economic resource here in, 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 in Tuscaloosa. Uh, just the abundance of water brings industry. It brings you know everybody together, the population. So uh, the abundance of water we have here is, is really phenomenal. Uh, and we, we have a lot of opportunities to expand that here as well. Um, so, uh, I, was, I was very blessed and, and, and asked to be here about, about the research to operations. Um, and so the question I, I'll start us with is how do we take the incredible research that's taking place here and all, all over the country, but really coming out of Alabama Water Institute and a lot of the, the great groups here in the, in the state of Alabama and turn it into action items that can help save lives and preserve resources. So. First and foremost, um, serving, I serve as the Director of Public Works. When I say serve, uh, that, that, is, that is ingrained in us in the city of Birmingham. Uh, we are here to serve the public. Um, and it would be remiss of me if we didn't, uh, I didn't mention the mayor's uh, mission in, in Birmingham and it's uh, building community through le servant leadership. Uh, his theme is putting people first and our core values are customer service, efficiency, effectiveness, transparency, and accountability. Um, the, uh, through the leadership of Mayor Wiffen, he's put me in this role to lead a department, uh, and we're making a lot of changes and striving for a betterment um, of, of the community and the quality of life for our citizens throughout Birmingham. Um, a little bit about us in Birmingham. Uh, so I work with a great group of individuals. Uh, we have, these are my three deputy directors. Uh, they serve as deputy directors of the Department of uh, Public Works with me. Uh, they are our horticulture lead, Mr. Nita Ryan. We've got Mr. Terry Davis, who serves as our um, deputy director over operations and uh, construction and waste services. And then we have Mr. Wayne Staten, who serves over our facility services division. Um, 
facility services is, is one of those that's a critical element in, in terms of uh, water. We talk about water, but conservation. We, we, we actually maintain over 120 facilities throughout the city of Birmingham, including Regions Field, uh, the JCCEO building that just, just uh, changed hands. Uh, we, we, we do City Hall, uh, the Boutwell Auditorium, major facilities across Birmingham that our team manages on a daily basis. And a little bit about what we do. Uh, we have five uh, main divisions. We have administration, uh, which is basically our employee services. Uh, with 630 employees, it takes a lot uh, to manage that. Uh, we also do construction operations, which is our main element that we'll be talking about here, here today when we talk about stormwater. Uh, in, in our construction division, we have street sweeping, uh, concrete work, uh, asphalt work, storm sewer system maintenance and, and, and rehab, and cl cleaning and demolition. Uh, throughout our waste services division, we do garbage pickup across the city and, and landfill uh, operations. We run two landfills. Uh, we also have a greenhouse. Uh, we do a lot of litter and weed abatement, uh, as well as um, code enforcement. We have some small sections of code enforcement in our department, uh, as well as uh, animal control, which is kind of a random one to be in our department as well. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this is what our current operation really looks like. Um, we break it down into five divisions, uh, and we have leads in pretty much all of those. Um, Interesting fact about the city of Birmingham, we actually have more land than the city of Atlanta. Uh, we manage more land than the city of Atlanta, but have half the population. Uh, and this is an interesting note. Um, I bring this up in this presentation here today to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the resources that goes with that. When you have half the population, you have half the resources as far as a tax base associated with, with uh, resources that you can go to in order to fix problems that you experience across your uh, city. The city of Birmingham is highlighted uh, here in red and splits two counties. It's actually in Jefferson and a portion of it is in Shelby as well, uh, which is rare to see a city split two counties like that a lot of times. Um, but we're actually very long. We're not, we're not very wide, but we're, or we're very wide, we're not very long. Uh, and so it, it makes stretching our resources across, uh, across the city very difficult. Um, let's see here today. So let's, let's talk about why we're here today and how we got here. So I started, as, as, as Zach mentioned, in, in the, the city of Tuscaloosa. Uh, I was an engineering student here, and they asked me, or I had, it was a requirement at the time that I had to do an internship. And for the construction engineering degree. And so I did one with the city of Tuscaloosa. It's under the direction of uh, city engineer Joe Robinson and uh, I guess assistant city engineer David Griffin at the time. And th those two were very instrumental to me. Uh, they helped teach me a lot of things. I was able to learn a lot about traffic engineering, uh, storm water, sanitary sewer, water distribution, uh, because we managed all those things in the city of Tuscaloosa. Uh, worked in engineering uh, my entire career there. Uh, I was close to a decade in Tuscaloosa in engineering. We handled permitting, inspection, compliance, hydrology, hydraulics, water quality, water quantity. We did floodplain management. Uh, we did drainage mapping, drainage maintenance, flood response. And so what really brings us here today is, you know, I experienced a professional team with Tuscaloosa. I experienced when I moved from the city of Birmingham, city of Tuscaloosa to the city of Birmingham, uh, I moved in the role as a stormwater administrator for the city of Birmingham. And under that, I, I managed a, a great team of chemists, biologists, geologists, uh, engineers uh, who did a phenomenal job. We had a lot of research, we had a lot of items that we, we learned, we were able to implement. Uh, but now that I'm in the public works sector, all the work that we do is on the ground. We don't have the whole research, we don't have the data gathering, we don't have a lot of the elements that we had in the other areas. So how do we bring those elements to the ground to the people that do the work in this public works department as well as uh, ones across, across the state? So um, in looking at things we do, we, we, we still do a lot of flood cleanup, uh, we, we do emergency response, we do barricading roadways, both heavy and soft closures. Uh, we do outreach, we do closure timings, we do project budgets, 
project design, project management, and then flow plane remapping after projects are done. Uh, and if you can think about those elements when you actually receive an issue, when you receive a problem, when, when, when we actually go out there and say, hey, this line is deteriorated and gone and we have to fix it. It takes a long time to go through each one of these steps in order to actually get to a resolve. And one of the things that I really wanted to talk about. So um, a good friend and uh, colleague uh, sent me over uh, this wonderful article that you just spoke about, the 360 um, million, the lead national water effort. Uh, and, and I read into it a good bit and I really started looking at it as how can we as the city of Birmingham partner with the university uh, and the Water Institute to potentially make some of these things on the ground real. So how can we save lives? How can we save resources? Um, one of the biggest things on the ground, and I'll get into in just a little bit, but is the timing. The timing is everything. Uh, so when you don't have the right people in the right place at the right time, it doesn't work. And we realize that over, over and over again. Uh, so when this was sent to me, I uh, reached out, I believe it, the first contact was with Zach, was that right? Um, and then I was able to get on some, some chats and just kind of discuss what could potentially be a partnership as we move forward. Um, and to give you a little context, um, these are the kind of problems we see. And this isn't, this, this isn't just a, a problem. This, is, this isn't a major storm event. This is a low-lying area um, that has a drainage problem a big drainage problem. And up above us, uh, there is railroad tracks. And so, you know, taking ownership uh, of the problem here, uh, I actually did research on this and it was very, very interesting. Went back, the state decided, uh, it was actually the state that came in and put the underpass under the railroad or in partnership with, at the time, LNN Railroad. Uh, in order to facilitate this. And uh, it's just one drainage problem. We have multiple drainage problems across the city. Uh, every city does. Um, but at the time, the state entered into an agreement with the railroad company that the city would maintain. The city wasn't even a partner in the contract. Uh, so maintaining a drainage system that runs parallel with the uh, railroad track is very difficult to say the least. Uh, if you get into the footing of the track and end up derailing a train, uh, I, would, I would rather just not touch it at all. Uh, so um, it, it, there's, a, there's a lot of, of history here. Uh, but this was put in a long, long time ago, and every flood event ends up like this. We know it's going to flood. We know it doesn't drain well. Uh, but you see the f police, I mean, you don't see the police in this picture, but you see the fire truck and the rescue engine in, in here. Um, and this is from news stories, it's, it's no secret. Uh, this area's flooded, and you know, how, how do we go about fixing it? And when you look into it, and you shoot grades on it, uh, do a general, general items that we would do to try and figure out how to make this drain, I don't know that it ever did drain. And so, asking ex experts in there, we, we get to it, and actually, here's that same L&N &L, Railroad, and look at the, look at the vehicles. They don't make cars like that anymore. Um, this problem, this blows me away. This has been a problem for this long and nobody has found a solution to it. Nobody has come up with a way to solve this problem. And, and this is, I mean, it, it, since day one flooded and, and we continue to just see it every day. Um, very excited that we put, Mayor Woodfin put a lot of money towards uh, doing some new engineering analysis uh, and potential projects here in order to do this, uh, try and get this corrected. Uh, but why should it have taken 60 years? Uh, you know, this, this, is a, this is a major problem. And so, um, you know, it, it, it didn't evolve overnight. This has been here. But as I see the flooding across the city, how do we as public works handle this problem? Do we run out there and put barricades out every time it runs, rains? Uh, so it's, it, it's a true problem and one that has very serious consequences. So one of the most recent flooding stories we have, this was about the time that, uh, let's see, it was 2022, uh, March. It was very close to the time that 
UA's announcement of the, the grant that they won for $360 million. And uh, I thought, wow, what a, what a time that the two came out. The mayor hosted a town hall on flooding in Birmingham. Uh, having a town hall to t discuss it and say, hey, how, we don't have the resources to for fully fix everything, but how can we go about it? What can we do as a city? How can we uh, get these things corrected? And also, not only that, but how can we protect our citizens? And so, got us thinking, um, how, how can we solve these problems? Research and technology exist today. Um, if you're all in water, which I assume you are, you've all looked at the USGS graphs, you've looked at all the uh, water data analysis, you've looked at stream gauges, you've looked at rates of rainfall. Uh, you can get real-time five-minute intervals on water rates. You can get real-time flood elevations on major streams. Uh, there's flood forecasting and flood prediction. We have flood mapping, we have repetitive loss data, we have warnings and social media outlets that we can post them on. And many, many more items that we can utilize as technology and research um, throughout the city. But in using these tools, who does it help? How does it help? Uh, is it saving lives and saving resources? I think the tools are great. I use them all the time. Um, we use them in a lot of different capacities. But since I've moved from the engineering realm and, and, and now on the ground with our teams, how do those items actually help us on the ground and, and, and with daily um, flooding? So, you know, when you think about it, a lot of these items, you know, are they helping the police? Are they helping the fire? Are they saving lives? Uh, so our first responders that are on the ground are the police, your fire and rescue, public works teams, transportation teams, and EMA. Is, is, you know, from a police, fire, public works, and transportation standpoint, I can tell you, none of those four are pulling up USGS stream gauges. None of them. I may be the only person in public works to do that. Um, but I'll tell you that, that EMA does, uh, and you have your state and your local EMAs, and we're part of that. When we have predicted weather that's coming, we set up incident command systems, and uh, we do have information that flows into the incident command center. Uh, but the mission here, depending upon what department you're in, is protect and serve, save lives, repair, replace, maintain, or warn of danger. So how do we do that? Um, the problems we face when we do this, when we go out and barricade streets, you may say, well, just barricade it off. Well, we've 80%, 90%, 95% of the year, the road's good to drive on. It's just that 5% during those times of heavy weather that it's not. Uh, so if you deploy warning, warnings or barricades, if you deploy them too early, people go around them. People don't see a danger, so they just continue to drive around. If you deploy warnings too late, accidents already occurred. Uh, how many teams are needed? This isn't the only location that we looked at. We have numerous locations across the city that, that have these similar issues. So how, how do you prioritize those locations? You know, you only have uh, a certain number of team members that can take out barricades, a certain number of teammates, teams that you can send out on any one given event. Uh, social media and news doesn't always reach your drivers. Uh, they may be listening to the radio, but it, it may not always tell them, Messer Airport Boulevard, Messer Airport Highway is underwater, do not travel there. And then also, when our police, so we get the call, um, Obviously, people don't call public works when they run a car into the water. They call police, they call fire and rescue, and they're sent out there and they, they go out and they, they block the roads and barricade the roads, and then they call us and say, hey, we're sitting out here until y'all get here. So it's not efficient, it's not effective, uh, and it's reactionary and not proactive. So potential project ideas. We talked about this a little bit is that identify locations across the city. Identify all the locations that we have these problems, but historical flooding, impacts of, of roadway conditions that create hazards, history of loss, private or public loss, that can be a vehicle you lose, that can be a, a loss of life, loss of resources, history of resources allocated to warn, and also analyze the long-term solutions needed, meaning it's not a quick fix. 
So even though the mayor may put $5 million towards Messer Airport Highway today, it's not going to be ready. It's not going to be ready within the next year. It's not going to be ready within the next year and a half. It takes design. It takes a lot of different elements in order to make it work. So one of the things we came up with is potential. Uh, and this isn't anything that's, that's new, but um, I would say adding sensors to these type items would be something that we could potentially put in these locations. Uh, potential on the ground sensors and warning tools in areas designated as long term projects to be able to fully warn drivers of the dangers being experienced at that time and at that location. So imagine if we had sensors, we've got sensors, I've been contacted by companies, hey we got sensors can do this, that and the other, I can tell you what chemicals are in your water at that inlet down there. Well if we have sensors that tell us okay the inlet's beginning to fill, it's reached a certain height, activates the warnings. Uh, you know when we're spending ten five, ten million dollars on a capital project that may take two years to complete. What's the cost of this that, you know, it, it can't be too much. And what's the cost of a life? So, you know, if we were able to initiate these type projects and at least warn people there on the spot, there's a danger approaching. Uh, I, I think we really could save some lives, potentially uh, save injury uh, and resources. So I mentioned that a little bit here, potential to save lives, injury, and property loss, uh, but also reduce the time and resources needed to warn of the dangers. So it's not, these storms happen at all times of the day and night. We send crews out, I have 24-7 operations. So we have a night crew, we have uh, crews running pretty much all day and night. However, when I have to send them out to, to warn or to put up barricades, things of that nature, it takes away from their daily activities. So things don't get done. So it's, it's, it's not something that we have crews just set up to always respond to emergencies. Uh, we have crews that have their normal jobs and then they're also set up to handle emergencies when it comes about. So uh, really looking at that and then the real time visual on site warnings. Only display, displayed at the onset of flooding and stops when the flooding is receded. Let's no, no loss of time waiting for setup or removal of barricades, no loss of time with BPD, our police department, our fire department, when they have so many other tasks that they're tasked with. Um, not sure if anybody went through sh a shortage of employees or are aware of shortage of employees, back order, things of that nature that happened during the pandemic. We were the same way. We couldn't get CDL drivers. Everybody went to Amazon because everybody was ordering to take it to your house. All our drivers left out the door. Um, you know, our police, our fire department, and several other departments still still trying to get re recover from that that loss. So ha being able to allow them to continue to do other things rather than waiting on us to show up uh, goes a long ways. Let's see. Summary. Summary is just existing efforts work to an extent. Um, but we must look to advance our warning systems to those that need them the most. Uh, a tweet, a Facebook message, a all user notification works in some, some scenarios. Um, but having something on site visible to say there is a danger here and alerting the person when it is occurring is something that we don't have. Drivers should not be engaged on their phone or watching news. Maybe they're listening to broad warnings over the radio when, raining, when raining, but not likely to the specific area they're driving. The tools to provide specific warnings at the right place, the right time, and to the right person are critical in protecting the public and known flood areas. Resources are not limitless. Um, as a municipality, we don't have the funds to correct all the measures and pro all the problems at all the locations. We are working to better the infrastructure, but funds are limited. Until projects are designed, built, constructed, and when new issues arise, this type of warning system will go a long way to protect the safety of the traveling public, save on public resources, and limit property damage. So I say all that to say um, there's a lot of students in the room. There's also a lot of professors, a lot of teachers, uh, a lot of leaders. Um, and again, I'm, I'm so humbly honored to be here to talk to you. Uh, but we, we have to bridge that gap. Uh, the title is Research to Operations. 
I've been on the research side. I've been there with our colleagues there on the research side. We've looked at it, but how can we put it on the boots on the ground, individuals that are there on the ground trying to perform the work? Uh, they, you know, when going to public works, that's one of the, the toughest transitions to managing uh, teams. And really what we found out is that there's not a lot of professionals in our, you know, professional backgrounds in our public works department. A lot of our individuals in public works that came up, uh, they started as a laborer and they were the best laborer there and they got moved up and they got moved up into an operator role. And they were the best operator and they got moved up into a supervisor role. They have extensive knowledge and great at what they do. Uh, but a technical background is not one, so we've got to train them. Uh, we've got to help teach them. And uh, so how do, we, how do we bring this research, how do we bring these great things that you're doing here and put them into real world applications? And that's, that's really what, what I'm here for today and what, what we were talking about. So um, I appreciate everybody's time. I uh, appreciate y'all allowing me to come speak here today and thank y'all for having me. Thank you, Josh. It's, it's always uh, very informative and inspiring to hear from people like you. We usually hear from our, you know, other academics, and so hearing things from your perspective is always very useful to us. And so, um, urban flooding and especially uh, forecasting of urban flooding is, is sort of the frontier, or even a little bit beyond the frontier of, of where we are now, at, at least at, at scale, like at the national scale. One of the problems we have at that arena is data. So getting the floodwater infrastructure, the high resolution DM, the, the cross sections and all that. Um, is that something, I, I'll ask it from your perspective, is that something that you think uh, if we just contact the right people we can get it or is it a problem from your end as well, getting all the data that is needed to, to do this kind of simulation for example? So are you talking about, you know, when you say cross sections and all, are you talking about survey grade data or what kind of grade data are you looking at? Well, let's, 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 uh, let's stick to, for example, the stormwater infrastructure mm -hmm. uh, network. So I, I, just a little bit about stormwater infrastructure, and it's not just the city of Birmingham. It was the same way in the city of Tuscaloosa and across, across the state. Uh, a lot of places do not have good data on their storm drainage networks. They have outfalls where it hits a creek because it's required by ADM in an MS4 permit. Uh, in regard to um, you know storm drainage across the state, there's just not very good data. We we were we were able to bring in plans and data onto uh, a lot of the the uh, construction plans and infrastructure GIS data in Tuscaloosa, uh, but in Birmingham there was very little. Uh, in fact, we've we've got roughly 35,000 inlets across the city. Uh, when I was over stormwater uh, administration there, uh, one of our main tasks I, I set out was to uh, GIS locate, map, photograph, and condition assessment uh, all the inlets across the city. And uh, by doing that work, we had a good idea how many issues we had. Uh, but there's not, there's just not a lot of stormwater data. And now you go to sanitary sewer or water distribution, you can get almost anything you want on those. Uh, but the, the stormwater side, a lot of people don't have a lot of that mapped. That's where a lot of the data you run into, the issues you run into there. Hello. Oh. So um, <clears throat> I'm from uh, Louisiana, from the Baton Rouge area, and uh, we, we have a lot of flooding and, and problems there. Um, and there was a particularly bad flooding event in 2016 um, that impacted our area and um, kind of lived through that and it was uh, canceled school for like multiple weeks and all people, people's houses were destroyed and um, uh, various schools were destroyed as well and like it took a long time to, um, not my school, but um, I was in high school at the time, but um, I was aware of like other high schools that got destroyed and it took years for them to even start to rebuild um, and so on. And um, that's just an example for my question was, which is just um, 
was wondering if you um, and um, all the people in your department in the in the city, um, do you have any kind of process of like collaboration or learning from um, other um, city officials from like other areas even outside of the state, like in Louisiana, for example, or even internationally? Is there any kind of um, collaboration process? So, so in terms of collaboration and, and, and work with other municipalities, yes, we, we do that. In fact, there in Birmingham, um, gotten very person that hired me in, the city engineer, who uh, left to uh, go to the city of Alabaster, is one of my good, good colleagues now. Um, but Alabaster, Pelham, Hoover, um, we all kind of coordinate there together. Uh, additionally, uh, yes, we reach out to other communities. You know, uh, part of what we're dealing with here, this doesn't really touch on the catastrophic level, like what you're experiencing, what you, what you mentioned. Um, this, is, this is just, you know, a heavy event. Uh, so, you know, when you get to those catastrophic levels, there is, if you've got a good EMA center, a good incident command center, uh, a good structure set up and in place, one that's already trained, one that's, one that's familiar with the ICS, the incident command system, and the, the terminology and, and the way people move. Um, that's usually the first sign and first setup when you get into the catastrophic events like what you're talking about. Um, and also, our, uh, you know, water resources, the Alabama Water, I think it's Alabama Water Resources Association, as well as the Alabama Floodplain Association, you know, we all meet from different areas across the state uh, and collaborate, talk different ideas and all as well. So uh, we do have those from other uh, uh, areas as well. We, we collaborate with them. Let's thank Josh again. Actually, I guess we got one more. <laughs> yeah. Josh, you, you showed one example for in situ sensor for detecting and give flood warning. I uh, just wondering, you know, so what can sensor you, know, you guys used for this type of in situ uh, detection? That's just, just wondering, you know, how widely, currently, you know, how many such type of sensor installed for such type of you know, work? Are you asking how many? Yeah, just how widely you know, that's a, use this technology for... Oh, I, I'm not aware of many places using that type of technology. That's, that's kind of why we, we came together to discuss it, just to see if it's possible that we could implement something of that nature. Um, I, there's a lot of places where you, you can actually initiate the warnings and turn them on remotely. Uh, but to have something that's actually real-time associated with the situations on the ground there, uh, you know, that, that's what would be very interesting. I don't, I don't know how many, I don't know if there's others that, that, that uh, have those deployed. I, I assume that it could be a possibility. I know that there's sensors and a lot of, I've had sensor companies reach out to me about the sensors they use for certain items, uh, but I've never ran across somebody that's like, yeah, we can do this and put it in here for elevation, and when it reaches that elevation, it triggers a warning. Um, so that's, that's really kind of what we were, we were aiming for to potentially reduce some of this. Uh, okay, some of the resources needed. Thanks. Yes, sir.